good to welcome you back to another episode of Ideas Space with the Urban Design Group, Urban Nouse and me, Christopher Martin. I'm an urban designer and planner focusing on the design of public realm and streets, co-founder and director of Urban Strategy at Urban Movement, and I'm on the executive committee of the Urban Design Group. I'm really trying to explore the full range of issues that influence the design of cities and shape society with this series, so we can sharpen our focus and create more enjoyable places. And for this episode, we'll be focusing on quality. We've been hearing a lot about planning reform, and a renewed focus on beauty and quality of late, which is fantastic. And there's a lot to be buoyant about in the national conversation at the moment in, term, in, in terms of urban design. But conversation has to lead to action and action has to lead to improved quality of life for everyone in cities, else we fail. This is something that our guest today is also committed to. So I'm really looking forward to the conversation and I'm thrilled to be joined by Nicholas Boyd smith Nicholas is, is director of Create Streets and has written widely on planning and on the links between design and the popular support for development. He's well, you've, said, you've said all about me now, nothing else to add. <laughs> exactly. Well, there's a little bit more. Um, he, he's chair of the government's uh, design body steering group, um, something we will, of course, be searching on today, and was co-chair of the Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission, which reported in 2020 uh, to widespread support. Nicholas, thank you so much for joining us. Total pleasure. Thank you, for, thank you very much for inviting me. It's very kind of you. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. And I wonder if I can first invite you um, just to introduce yourself and your work, more so than I've just done there, um, and, and sort of the ethos and work of Create Streets and indeed the uh, newly formed Create Streets Foundation, I see. Oh, well, so it's not that new. Um, yes. And do you, I've got some slides. Do you, would you like me to use those? Or, yeah, that'd be or excellent. That? Yeah, if you don't mind. Yeah. Perfect. I, I, shall, I shall do that. So, um, brilliant. Brilliant. So, um, uh, my name is Nicholas and I set up Create Streets, gosh, seven years ago now. And I actually set it up out of... Uh, out of frustration, I think it's fair to say. I mean, I, I make no bones of the fact that I, I don't have a professional background in design or even in development or in or in planning. But you know, I I, I do live in London. I do live in a town, and therefore <laughs> have a, have a hopefully a right to have a point of view on it. And uh, living in South London became increasingly frustrated at what I saw. I think correctly as the very poor quality of both the new places that were being created, but also I think of the stewardship of the existing public realm. Um, and the more I started getting annoyed about it, the more I tried to start in spare moments trying to find people to talk to about it. Because I began to think this is incredibly important. And I don't think, and I, I think it has got better, but I, I came to the view that the people who knew about it were not talking about it or using evidence in such a way that I thought was going to effectively influence politicians or senior decision makers in I know, the treasury or in places that, if you like, were not design focused because the language was one of design and that wasn't speaking, I thought, to ultimately decision makers. So that, that's essentially why I set up Create Streets. And uh, um, hang on, let's, let's go forward. So we do, I mean, we're a social enterprise and we have an associated charity, the Create Streets Foundation, which is, it is a bit, uh, a bit younger. And, you know, we have a clear vision, which is to make, you know, there, there are not enough homes, particularly in the southeast of England and, and a few other hotspots, and is to make it easier to build new homes by fundamentally changing the politics of the design and development of new places. Um, so it's easier to co-create beautiful, gentle density places in which people thrive and are, I think, our key view, and I, I suspect you share this, and I suspect many of the uh, listeners watchers do, is that you can be quite objectively confident about the source of places that tend to be popular and good for you. That's not to say that you can predict how every single individual human will respond to a place. You can't, but you can predict how the majority of people will behave and respond in reaction to certain types of places you know, most of the time. So, you know, we do, a, the first thing we do is primary research into that. And then, some, if you like, summarizing as a secondary research, the research that's out there and hopefully communicating it uh, in a way that can impact the debates about places. Uh, partly to bring that to life, partly to pay for it, partly because it's important. We are now working with a growing range, mainly of neighbourhood and community groups, but actually increasingly, and this is a very exciting development of the last couple of years, increasingly with landowners and councils and developers as well, if you like to put that research into practice. And we also, and, and you touched on this in your introduction, we take an active role in debate on planning and development policy, of which more, no doubt, are none. So that, that's what we do. And I've got a few quick slides on that. Here's, a, here's an example of one of our recent books of, of Streets and Squares, which is on free download. Um, that's trying to pull together the evidence on the types of places that people like and why. Here's just one of the bits of research we did for this. We worked with uh, um, uh, several scientists uh, um, 
to, to, to use a tool that predicts with a high level of confidence based on many hundreds of thousands of responses to hundreds of images, thousands of images, the types of places in which people wish to be. And we then score them out of six. So you know, this, if you like, is done by the computer based on actual responses to real places. These are the types of places that on the whole, most of us don't want to be most of the time. I, I don't think that's telling anything particularly insightful, other than if you like, if you like the, the tool's getting it right. Um, and these are the places, uh, I think they're the three that scores highest in London. Uh, of the images we chose. It wasn't obviously all, 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 all bits of London. Uh, and they've all got quite similar things in common. They're all quite well enclosed, tend to have a bit of greenery, not all of them, and tend to feel quite, quite, quite safe and an agreeable place. So, you know, that's the type of research we, some of that we try to do. Here's another online poll we did on the types of squares people would rather spend time in. And again, it leads to a slightly tighter form of urbanism as a place people feel more comfortable in. We also, we're very interested in pricing data. Uh, I do hope this is interesting. If not, and obviously there are other things to do uh, available on the internet. Um, we also look at pricing data. So this was a study we did a few years ago of every single property sale in London during 2016. Um, and what we found was, if you like, the place premium, the heritage premium, we think is, is uh, much more important than most surveyors tell you. Because when you look at every single place, every single sale, you find that areas that are, you know, this, uh, this is adjusting for centrality, mm. Uh, places with a high uh, connected node ratio, high traditional street pattern, close to a high proportion of listed buildings, uh, is getting to a value premium, other things held equal, which is four, five, six times as high as the new build premium, other things held equal. So, you know, so you know, revealed preferences of pricing, you know, we think is a legitimate way of approaching what people like. Um, yes. We then try and summarize that in a way that councillors, officials, but also members of the public and politicians can understand. So here are some of the key themes we try and pull out from the wider data traction of gentle density greenery little and often has more impact on objective well-being than greenery you know, miles away structuring of benches and statues the importance of facade actually and that, that word beauty again important to mixed use something that i'm sure you're all very aware of uh, of edges of a human scale enclosure and of, of, of highly walkable environments not necessarily the same as making it walkable everywhere um, we're a big fan of traditional block patterns that's well associated with uh, places people feel safer in, and indeed with, with, with lower crime, uh, with some good UK and Australian data. Big fans of mixed use, as I'm sure you all are. Um, this is a study I'm sure many of you know, which is try and get it out there in the public debate. This is the 19th, this is the Apple Yard study from the 70s of friendship patterns and levels of traffic. As you probably know, it's been replicated recently in Bristol. Um, we are, and this is perhaps some an area where we disagree with some architects, perhaps most architects, who knows. We're big fans of the importance of facade quality on how people respond and their um, support for building. Indeed, we, I think the, the evidence on this is incredibly clear. I could cite many, here's just one. This is a, a lovely study done by Happy City. Volunteers pose as lost tourists in front of these both buildings, both in the same part of the same city. And you get quite differential responses from the public in terms of how spontaneously you know, helpful they are to the, to the spuriously lost tourists. Um, color, some of the most pictured uh, streets in, in Paris or London or in, in, in Venice where this is are very colourful streets and there's good evidence on how that improves mood. Also things like um, um, symmetry and, and variety in a pattern. And then we try and put it all to life by doing co-design, by working with uh, residents or neighbours or stakeholders. Here's a workshop we ran just <laughs> one of the last workshops at the end of last year, early remember this those. year. <laughs> yes, do you remember those? Yes, precisely in West London. Um, and this is, this is actually something, this isn't finished. This is some work we're currently doing uh, in the West Country, trying to put together, if you like, the, the best of the old and the best of the new. So there's some sustainable drainage running through the middle of what hopefully is a, uh, a new town, town centre. Um, uh, lockdown, you hinted at. So we're now using uh, what we call Create Communities Platform, which by happy coincidence, we launched just as lockdown was starting, which is a, a, a tool to help people you know, get, a, get ahead of the process and map what they like or what they don't like. Uh, about places uh, they don't like that um, and uh, we then allow that allows us to quickly work up targeted interventions and we got nearly a thousand in our first time we used this we got in leads we got nearly a thousand responses in four days so we're very you know we're big fans of how can you efficiently and effectively crowdsource information um, we then try to influence the public debate because we think oh, I, I believe that uh, elements of the planning and design process had gone uh, had gone and have gone wrong. This is making this is using urban design to make the case for gentle street based densification of a, of, of a box land site in North London. We try and make the research usable. So, this is some work we're currently doing for a county council, trying to pull forward themes that you, you all know very well, Christopher, into things that councillors as well as officials can get their heads around. Uh, as you mentioned, I co chaired last year with the late Roger Scruton the, the Building Better, Building Beautiful report, which I, I think it'd be fair to say. Um, was controversial at its inception. And I think by the time we finished, 
it was met with very widespread support from the Secretary of State through to certainly the majority of, of professionals and experts. So, I mean, gently, we were quite pleased with that. And we hope we move the, the debate on a bit to the importance of urban quality and design quality on the lives that we that we lead. Um, just to touch on some of the points we make, which I think are important, we try and make the point that the regulation of the built environment is not new. And oddly, I think both the left of centre and the right of centre, for opposite reasons, get this slightly wrong. So if you like, and I'm being a bit unfair to, to, to everyone here, but you know, the crude right of centre view will be, you know, evil, nasty planning started with post-war socialism. And the crude left of centre view will be, oh, marvellous planning started with, you know, post-war socialism and stop the market, you know, dominating everything. And they're both equally wrong. Uh, we have been regulating what we build in towns and cities, you know, literally for as old as cities. This is a, from the Indus Valley civilization. There's very clear evidence of, of clearly regulated block patterns. And you get the same in Anglo-Saxon streets and Roman insular and you know, anything, you, anything you choose to name. Um, uh, there's, there's a consequence of the 1774 uh, Building Act. That's a second rate house. Uh, you know, far more tightly regulated, actually, what you could build in London in the 18th century than it is today. Uh, also, because it was fire, uh, fire risk, which seems oddly and sadly pertinent. Um, we also, and I think we've had influence on this, talk about comparative planning as well as historical planning. This is a not very pretty, I apologise, uh, summary of uh, how the local plan in the English system is actually a far less binding document than is the case, not just in common law, uh, not just in um, uh, Code Napoleon countries, as you mainly see here, but also actually, I don't think they're in the paper on the page, sorry, in countries working under more common law systems. So Australia, a different way, New Zealand, and in a very more complicated way, the states have all moved in a direction that actually realises, and this is clearly true in the wider economics of regulation, that when you regulate something, you should regulate it. If the state has a role, it should have a role. It shouldn't, it should, wherever possible, it should be predictable. It's obviously not always predictable. And when things are gameable, then that tends to be a, a quite important barrier to entry. And it is no surprise, I, I fear, that with each economic crisis and cycle, uh, the English development market has become more and more concentrated. And we are now almost uniquely dependent on a very small number of developers and house builders to build a vast majority of our places. And that's not, to actually, that's not actually to criticise them. Um, they're doing, if you like, what they're incentivised to do. But we need to get back to, to a world where uh, uh, there's a larger number of small and medium-sized players. Um, if it's helpful, though, it's obviously still pre-lockdown. These were the, the key themes we pulled out of the Living with Beauty. Um, I think there's a... Oh, no, let's just touch them all rather than play games with uh, call outs. But it was about planning. Um, that has been picked up, quite a lot of that in the white paper. One of the themes that's not yet been picked up was what we, so we described as stewardship. Which, and uh, the key and difficult policy ask there was changing some of the tax system so that VAT and the treatment of income versus capital gains tax would cease to incentivise pulling down buildings and putting up new ones and would cease to incentivise landowners to sell land as quickly as possible rather than taking a long-term view. Uh, we also had a lot to say about the ways in which, unintentionally actually, uh, planning rules or guidance on back-to-back -back distance or light tend to, make, tend to pull the urbanism apart. Whenever you get, and as I'm sure you know, it's very, very hard to, to make the case for tightly grained density, for pulling a town together in the way that used to be the case, uh, and which provably, based on values, people normally prefer. Um, uh, we also made quite, quite a lot of comments on regreening, on, on the need for street trees, which is a, a, quite a no-brainer in the data. Ultimately, we made a case for trying to move from what we called a vicious circle of parasitic development, unclear quality after in the planning system, despite in principle support for development, then opposition on the ground to new development, leading to an insufficient new homes in the right place, and then an on-level playing field, uh, which puts downward pressure on quality. And that's the model, I'm afraid, that most developers now have to take. And again, that's not even really to criticise them. It's, it's the way what they sort of have to do. And we've tried to stretch out a vision, which I think the white paper has picked up on or tried to, of, of a virtuous circle, circle of regenerative development with very clear quality ask from the planning system. Or if it isn't a quality ask, just leave it there and allow the developer to respond to what people want. But it's the stuff in the middle that can get, make such a mess. Uh, the removal of the unintended incentives for the next field development model, that's the income versus capital gains tax, um, so that most people see that development is likely to be a net improvement, and actually asking for that in the MPPF. We made a very clear ask that development should make things better by, by diversity gain as well as uh, overall gain, uh, and that people therefore have more of a sense of an agency and complete revolution in how we think about the local plan and the requirements on local authorities to meaningfully engage with people on that, and that a local plan that's more visual, or code based and clearer what it means as opposed to being 300 pages of, of policy that can quite easily be broken, which clearly doesn't engage people because why bother, um, would hopefully ultimately change the market. And finally, I don't know why this is the last slide, it probably shouldn't be, we made a case for gentle density 
uh, as the type of urban development which tends to, not always, get the best of both worlds. That's not to say you should do it everywhere, but tends to have the advantages of propinquity, uh, less land use, more walking, more sustainable development patterns, actually knowing more of your neighbours, which as long as it's a controlled thing is good for most of us, but also the advantages of low density as well. And it's important to stress those. They are perhaps not stressed enough by some urbanists and architects and maybe even members of the urban design group. I don't know. Um, yeah, but there are advantages to low density and it's important to recognise that. And that's why most people want to live uh, actually in the suburbs or in a detached house. That is the preferred living model for the vast majority of our compatriots and indeed around the world. Uh, and that's because you get more personal space. You get your own personal green space. And people are very right in wanting those things. It's completely natural. They're being very rational. But can we get it? Can we find a way of trading off the advantages of superb, superb, sorry, sub, 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 suburbanism, I'll start again, with also the advantages of density. And I think in the, in the sort of, if you like, the Victorian uh, suburban model, more finely grained, more at the sort of 70 or 80 homes per hectare rather than the 20 to 30 that the, the nice gentlemen from the big firms do now. I, I think you can get uh, most of the time more of those advantages. And I think I should probably stop there. I hope that wasn't too uh, tedious. Thank you very much. Not at all, it's, it's, it's a very kind of you to share. And I think I'm really great to hear, and I think to me it highlights the power that streets, um, transport, public realm and, and urban development have, a, have over their quality of life. And, and, and so by default, the importance they have, importance of quality or of a design um, has, and I really, I really enjoy the fact that you're trying to, you're sort of weaving in sort of human decision making and human behaviour and choice into that, and using that to actually to pl to plan um, to plan cities in a way. I think it's it's, a, it's um, very very unique. Thank you. I think you've to, to move on to and touch on some of the things you mentioned. You've been invited by by the Housing Secretary Robert Jenrick um, to lead a national uh, design body that's been tasked with driving up design standards for development, as you as you've outlined there. Um, how are you going to go about this, uh, do you think? And, and what are your ambitions for this organisation? Appreciating, of course, that uh, it's just, get, just getting going and still a lot to be decided. Yes, <laughs> far more to do than is done. Um, what I'll do, well, if we perhaps put on the, uh, the web page afterwards, the link to the page about the steering group, that will sort of yes. help, help people. Um, uh, so we, we have literally just got going in the, last, uh, in the last month or so. I'm really proud and grateful uh, that a fantastic group of people have agreed to be on the steering group, which is, is looking at the body. Uh, many of them will be known, I suspect, to many of you. Um, Andrew Cameron is, a, is a probably quite a well-known urban designer and street designer. Vidya Alexson, who runs the Power to Change Fund, very, very knowledgeable about community leadership and community capacity. Uh, Sarah James, who leads on planning from Civic Voice. Um, Esther Kurland, who runs Urban Design London, again, I'm sure known to many of you. Uh, ben Gummer, who used to be in the cabinet um, and uh, now is a developer. Victoria Hills, Chief Executive of RTPI. Ben Page, who runs Ipsos Mori. Sorry, I will stop the list soon, but actually it is, it is partly <laughs> answer your question, which is that yes. the, the answer, I should have said this up front, and I will, I'm going to name the rest afterwards to be fair, but you know, uh, the, my role, I think, is to pull together the experts and the specialists in the different things that are relevant, I think is the first part of my answer. And I, I will name the others because I think it's important. Um, Adrian Penfold, who used to be head of planning for British land and prior to that ran a local planning authority. Uh, Robert Adam, who's an architect. Uh, Paul Moynihan, who's an architect. Anna Rhodes, who runs the, um, uh, um, gosh, I've gone, the uh, planning service. Stephen Stone, who used to be chair of Cress Nicholson. I think very important to understand the perspective of volume house builders now chair of a RSL. Uh, and John Hayes, an MP, who's our, who are sort of parliamentary liaison. And, and the reason for listing all those, I'm sorry, that was a little bit uh, telephone directory, so I apologise. The, the reason is to, is to make that point, is I'm trying to pull together lots of the talents. And there's actually a wider range of people we've also asked to make presentations to us and, and, and feed in in various ways. So that's the first part of the answer. Uh, the second part, and I, I can say this because it's, it's public, is, I mean, we've been quite clear in trying to set a clear brief with the Secretary of State and with the kind officials at the Ministry of Housing. And we've set out uh, five key questions, and I'm not going to read them all to you, but I, I will highlight what they are, because this, this is what we're, you know, what we're trying to ask. So the first thing we're asking is, well, what are the methods for robustly demonstrating community support for designs? There's a phrase used a lot in the white paper, I think picking up on something in, in the B4C report of what's provably popular. And we, 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 we're not in any way ashamed of things that are popular, that things should be popular. Um, and how can that feed into the setting of design codes or, or uh, local statements of quality? How, how you know, the, it, it, it's reasonable for the state, if you like, to set the framework for thinking about it, but, but clearly what is right in Hackney or the Cotswolds or Sunderland or Taunton, you know, is going to be different and should be different. So what's the efficient way for different local communities or LPAs to, to discover that, to use a, a common law phrase? So that's our first key question. Our second key question is what skills and capacities are available amongst local authorities 
communities and house builders and other developers. So if you like, where are the gaps currently in, in, in capacity and skills? And clearly one of the key themes that came out of our work in B4C, and has I know come up already in the response to the white paper, has been uh, capacity in local planning authorities. So that's certainly, that's there in the mix. And then critically, uh, I think this is quite a hard question, what are the most efficient and effective ways to support local authorities and communities efficiently to feed into this process there is not i think you know in a workable way and this is not despite this is despite the great work and good intentions of you know thousands of people up and down the country i, I do not think the process of communities feeding into local plans is currently working and as i say that's not to criticize the people doing it i just think it's a, i'm afraid it's a statement of fact i think so you know, how do we completely reinvent that and how do we help hard press local authorities you know who don't have you know, time to sort of spend half a week here half a week there was on, on on training and that wouldn't necessarily get there how do we help them get there um, and then, you know, thus, what are the priorities for a new design body? Wh wh where are the key places it should be focusing? And we don't have the answer to that. So I'm not going to I'm not going to tell you now, not because not I'm hiding it from you. I just don't know yet. Um, and then obviously, as a function of all that, well, therefore, what should the body be? How should it be set up? How big does it need to be? Uh, is it quite a network thing? Is it a small central team? Does it need to be bigger? And you know, all those questions are to, are to define in the, in, the, in the weeks and months to come. That was probably a far longer answer than you wanted, but anyway, that's the answer. No, I'll, it's, I'll it's, put the link to those in the thing. And I, I genuinely encourage anyone who's anyone who's watching this is presumably interested in this subject. If not, again, there are lots, lots of other things available <laughs> on the internet. Um, you know, and if, if you've got clear and strong and above all, hopefully well-evidenced views on those, you know, send us an email. Um, please, please get in touch and send us thoughts. Send us thoughts. I'd be very yeah, grateful. absolutely. And I, I very much like that, that term you've, you've sort of coined of provably popular. Um, I think it, and it speaks to the research you were talking about earlier as well, which is which is very nice and, 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 uh, and very important, I think. But I think in terms of that sort of taking that phrase of provably popular, um, what do you think are the, the major obstacles for you um, and, and this this group um, going forward um, uh, to achieving your aims? Well, I, mean, I think there's, um, you know, we're not starting from a good place in the sense that um you know the, the built quality and the, you know, this is not my personal view so i think it's a statement of fact that the built quality of much that has been delivered over the last 20 or 30 years again with many lovely exceptions you know, bluntly has not been very good we've been i think the volume house builder model is not producing good places i think too much of the stuff we've built in city centers above all london but not just london uh has not been a sustainable uh model it's been i think overdeveloped um so you know we start with a very level low very low levels of public confidence in developers and in the planning system that's that's you know i mean you've probably seen the uh the poll i think that yougov did for grosvenor last year I, I, this is from memory. I may not get the numbers right, but from memory, it was two and seven percent, which you know, <laughs> that's pretty bad. So you know, we're not starting with public confidence. Uh, we are starting um, with uh, uh, an area where large parts of the country, the develop the uh, local planning authorities have been under enormous development pressure, uh, and others actually where they've been desperate for investment. We have a, quite a regionally uh, bifurcated country in terms of development patterns and local prosperity. Sorry, so there's too much pressure of development in some places and bluntly not enough in others. So again, for, for almost for different reasons, I think local officials are under uh, quite difficult pressure on this. So I think those, those sort of like systemic challenges are serious. And then I, again, hopefully just a statement of fact, uh, you know, it, politics is quite volatile at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, there are quite strongly held views. And then I think in the response to the white paper, which uh, you know, I can see why bits of it were controversial, but I hope that anyone sensible reading it would find there's quite a lot in there that it shouldn't be and isn't, that the sort of extreme reactions against it from some people who I won't name, um, I was a bit, I found quite disappointing. Because I think there are, you know, there are always criticisms you can make and that things can always be better. I think the, the fact that, you know, I think there should have been, or could have been more on infrastructure, I think that's a fair, a fair challenge. Uh, I don't think it's wrong that it was housing led. We don't have enough homes in this country where there's high areas of demand. Um, and that creates enormous, um, generational inequality and is causing you know relative poverty for people below a certain age that that is something that's legitimate for any government to to want to face into and that's that's an existential challenge for for, for any british government um but so i think those those three things if you like are the, are the key underpinning challenges that i think will make any type of reform difficult I, I could go into more detail on on specifics but i think actually those are the big ones yeah no thank you i think um one thing that isn't provably popular, uh, and I'll stop using that. that, that, that no, phrase it's a good phrase. Keep it's, going, it's, keep going. It's, uh, it's good. Um, it's change. And, and I think for where we are at the moment um, with the, the government's sort of uh, uh, gear change document and LTM 120, for example, um, there's a, clearly a new ambition for the way we use streets, um, urban streets, um, as opposed to residential streets uh, in particular. 
So how do you think um, this new body um, is going to balance or can balance or should balance um, those sort of local desires with, with national policy standards and, and wider um, government ambitions? I mean, first of all, the premise of your question is absolutely right. You know, there's good academic research showing that, you know, other things held equal, we prefer the one we had before to the one that's actually identical that we think is ch changed. And, you know, if you tell someone that this is 10 years old and this is new, they'll prefer the one that's 10 years old. So you're, you're absolutely right. that you know, and, and there's also a good rational reason for that, which is that if the status quo is acceptable, particularly when you've got very low levels of trust in developers or the planning system, why take the risk of change? So, I, you know, again, I have some emotional sympathy uh, with people who don't necessarily want change, because you know, if if if, if now is okay, why take the risk? Um, but you know, so, so you're, I think the premise of your question is is correct. And, and I think the and I, I say this as someone who's obviously pro changing the way we use streets and making them more humane and, and walkable. Um, the, the criticism that what's essentially a strategic change to streets was sort of smuggled in as part of the response to COVID. If I'm honest, I think does have some credibility. I mean, I think there's some validity to that. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm all for it, frankly. But you know, I think it was a it was a valid it was a valid criticism. I think I think we have to accept that. Um, and I think the, the role for any for the national government for any design body isn't to say do this here, do this do this there, but it's to help hard press local authorities um, understand the process that is mo most likely to get more more, more public support. Um, one of the things, is, and you'll probably know more about this than, than I do, Christopher, when it comes to street usage, and, and again, I'm very conscious that probably most people watching know more about this than me, is, is allow people to trial things very briefly uh, in something that isn't permanent. So, you know, do this for a Sunday, do this, you know, for a bit of August, uh, do it at a certain time of the day when, you know, kids are being dropped off to school and the, the, the school streets movement is, is, is happily gathering pace. So uh, I think that's one part of it. This doesn't have to be a permanent and non-reversible change. Uh, another part is what I hinted at in my presentation, which is bringing as many, well, I didn't hint at it, I said it, <laughs> it's bringing as many as people, you know, to misquote Churchill, into the tent peeing out rather than outside the tent peeing in. You can never get that perfect and there'll always be the dangers of, of, of all sorts of things going wrong. But if you can crowdsource suggestions, yeah, there's some challenges to be seen on that. And we've seen that recently in terms of people who may not live there actually having a point of view. So you've got some things to manage. Uh, crowdsource suggestions, you know, involve different range of groups in, in discussing and being involved in some of the pros and cons. And there's some challenges there. How do you make sure that the people who turn up on a Tuesday evening are representative? Frankly, they're not normally. They tend to be older. They tend to be more middle class. They tend to be more prosperous. Nothing wrong with being all those things, but clearly you need to adjust for that. Um, by the way, making getting more representative groups might make people less uh, uh, keen on change. I think it's quite possible in some cases. So, you know, that doesn't necessarily make your lives easier. So, but I think those are the types of pr approach that, be, that are needed. But above all, we've got to allow people to see that this can be better. Uh, so that it isn't something that's theoretically told to them by people they don't necessarily trust, but is something they're beginning to see the lived experience. I think one other thing I made that I think is changing the, the politics on this is the increasing realisation of the importance of air quality. Again, something you'll know very well. Uh, and I think you can see that in some of the data. I'm certainly personally anecdotally seeing it from conversations with you know, people my age with young children. Um, I think there is a there is a C generational change happening now in terms of people's expectations of air quality. And I think that will just go on and on. Absolutely. I think and I, I truly support that idea of, um, of bringing people with you and, and, and making the case. I think we've been doing a huge amount of work over, over the, the last few months around just sort of holding community forums and convening these community conversations across wide different groups who are, who are at loggerheads in a sense over, over some of the changes they're seeing on their streets. And I think that those forums when we can just bring people together and actually discuss what their worries are and, and, and then actually try and find progress in that by actually, we, we understand there's a line in the sand for you, but it's not the whole thing that you want to throw out. It's actually just this, this is your line in the sand. And if we treat that as, as a fix, as, a, as part of this design brief, we can collaboratively build up. Then we can sort of generate together what that street can look like or what that public realm can look like, what that development can look like. And I think that sort of having that conversation is, is it's just key, I think. And you can't, you know, I, so based on my experience, and, uh, you know, it's not that everyone's reasonable and marvellous, they're clearly not, but most people are reasonable. And actually, most people, you know, people are pretty rude on social media, but face to face, most people are pretty courteous. Um, it wasn't urban design movement, but it was uh, it was urban design of a, a state regeneration a few years ago. And it was one of those lovely case studies. We had two people who were being very difficult and challenging. Um, and during the course of, you know, a day's charrette, by the end of it, one of them was, you know, was holding the pen and completely engaged. I'd say mm -hmm. the other wasn't, but, you know, we sort of, you know, it was actually, it was major progress. So I, I do I do think it works, but nevertheless, you, you know, you, you can't do that 
all the time for every site. There's, we've got to we've got to be thoughtful about budgets and what what is doable. So it's, it's going to be about you know uh, allowing people to see for themselves so that they're, they're, they're less resistant. And people are far more conscious of what they're losing or they might lose than something they haven't yet gained. Again, that's something that's very clearly I think shown in research on on, on behavioural psychology. So again, allowing people to understand the upside as well as be conscious of the downside. Yeah, very important. And I think a lot, a lot of consultation is just sort of collecting negativity in traditional consultation. So the idea of actually engaging in these conversations is really important to try and find a way forward. And yes, that's that's the, the, that's what we should be aiming for. And I suppose just in, into my last question, uh, I suppose the Urban Design Group has um, a pool of, of, of incredibly talented, incredibly willing um, and incredibly um, expert urban designers in, in, their, in, in, in their forum. Um, what do you need from us, from them, um, to help support this new design body and, and make sure it achieves its aims? Well, that's a brilliant question. Thank you. Um, I, I don't have a neat answer to that. Let me, let me try and give an answer that's as, as, as powerful and useful as well. I mean, the, the first thing is what I said earlier, which is, you know, do please, if you've got two minutes spare, have a look at the questions on, uh, on, the, on the web page on this and the, on the Ministry of Housing. And, you know, do, do, do send thoughts and suggestions. That would be, be the first point. And I think the second point would be... Um, uh, you know, there's. I, I assume what's going to happen because I think it'll take a while for legislative change to happen. So I, I assume that this design body will be in place before then. I'm, I'm making an assumption. Um, we're going to have to think through. You know, there's, there's obviously a new national design code coming shortly, which I should have actually mentioned earlier, which Andy Van Bradsky and uh, David Rudlin and Urbid have been working on, as as is known, which follows on from the national design guide. Is you know. The, the, the best codes, I think, are local. They're not. They're not sort of uh, regional. They're not all of a bit of London. You know, you've got. They've got to be quite specific. Um, there's a lot of thinking to be done about how we can cost and time efficiently set codes amongst the core things in a way that people can understand um, in this bit of London or this bit of Devon or this bit of Liverpool, wherever it might be. Um, you. There are lots of people out there, you know, who've got great ideas on this and great experience. And there'll be good examples. I, mean, I know I know some of them myself. There are good examples in other countries as well. Um, I'm assuming what we want to do is to start piloting examples, to start working, you know, to share. I think sharing best practice is an incredibly powerful tool. Um, which are the stories, the people, the individuals, the places, we all know some of them, that, that can be shared? What are the ways of efficiently getting them online getting them into wider civic society. One of the reasons that I was particularly keen to have Vidya, uh, Alex and Sarah James on the, on the steering group was, so we're not just talking to planners and take that in the best possible way, but you know, so we're out there talking to people who, who, who understand some of the bits of civic society, you know, because they live it and breathe it. Um, what are the ways that we can get, you know, videos or ideas about air quality or ideas about walkable streets or ideas about uh, making a place feel safer? What are the ways we can get ideas out, out into the wider public so it can have a million well, 60 million different authors rather than just, you know, those of us on this call who are perhaps a little bit obsessed by this subject. So that's the sort of how we get it out there beyond just those of us who are members of the Urban Design Group or who, you know, work Great Streets is, is I think, the really powerful question. And ideas for that is, is I think, what we're really in the market for at the moment. Fantastic. It sounds like you need a, you need the, uh, the modern day Ian Nairn to be getting the sort of the, uh, the, the sort of common message out there and speaking to speaking to people about these issues. It sounds. Yes, I think that's, I think that's a very, a very good point. And what we certainly we in Create Streets, it's not quite the same thing, but we're certainly trying to get more videos out there as a, mm -hmm. as a way of getting the message beyond you know, people I can meet or the people my team can meet. Um, uh, so we're, we've, we, it won't be right yet, but we've done a little video on what is a design code, which we're trying to share with as many councils and officials as possible. We've done a little video on what makes for popular places, which again, we're, sort of, we're getting out there. I think, yeah, I, I'd, I'd encourage all of you to sort of use the information on what's popular. I, perhaps is, don't be scared of what's popular. What I often find is, you know, words like popular and beautiful, uh, you, know, we, we, I, you know, I've had a lot of criticism for, for wanting to use those words and those concepts and thinking that's important. But I, I'm sure, you know, be, be confident in, in helping people find what they like and where they feel comfortable, I think is something that is incredibly important. Yeah, very well put. I, I, think, I, I think it's an enormous opportunity at the moment for, for, for all built environment professionals uh, and students. And so I, I would certainly uh, join you in urging um, everyone to be striving for quality in what they do and in everything they do, asking how will this improve quality of life? Um, I really would love to talk more, but this is that's all the time we've got, I'm afraid. Um, so I want to thank you again, Nicholas, um, you. and encourage everyone to follow the work of the design body as it emerges. Um, I also want to thank everyone who's listening in as well. Um, hope you've enjoyed this episode of Ideaspace, 
um, by the Urban Design Group, Urban Nows and me, Christopher Martin. Um, more episodes coming your way, so please do get in touch if you have any questions and follow the Ideas, Ideas Space YouTube channel um, to, 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 see it, to see them all. Thank you very much. Thank you.